Our speaker is Celia Bourne. She has been a librarian here in the Genealogy Center since 1983. And Celia has done a number of presentations at the local, state, and national levels, primarily on Civil War research and the use of periodicals, though her special interests include Southern and Western states, as well as Civil War research. And I do have to tell you, Celia does have a propensity to have these types of questions come to her when she is on our desk answering customers' queries. So Delia is definitely the person to discuss this topic with you today. So without further ado, Delia Bourne. Thank you for coming and seeing us today. Uh, we've had a lot of discussion recently about illnesses and we, we see COVID, et cetera, on, um, on the news all the time and, and the statistics and the statistics sometimes seem very strange. So we're going to be discussing first off medical throughout the ages. Um, we're going to be concentrating on Western European because uh, most, much of America is rooted in Western European um, traditions, et cetera. And in Europe uh, for a long time, medical care fell to the families or to the religious orders. Um, you would have uh, mainly Christian, the, the nuns, the, the brothers, et cetera, um, taking care of people who fell very ill, but most of it was actually the family. Um, you had someone that grew very old and very weak or got very sick, and it was usually the women of the household that were taking care of these family members. Um, but the religious orders did pick up the slack in some areas. And that worked in England until Henry VIII disbanded the religious orders uh, there in England and the hospitals that were supported by these religious orders. There were a lot of them in London. Uh, and then so hospitals, general hospitals, um, sort of came into being back then. And hospitals at the time that were... Um, known, it wasn't like the ones we know now. Um, they prospered throughout the 16th and 17th centuries after Henry VIII and, and that sort of time period. In the hospitals, they uh, made observations of diseases and symptoms. And this is really when uh, organized medical progress really started. Before that, it was, you might have one medical um, practitioner for an area and he, or maybe she, but usually he became very familiar with what was going on in the area, but he didn't know everything was going on elsewhere. Uh, but they began making observations in the hospitals. And that sort of devolved into what we know as the, the uh, modern teaching hospitals, where people were learning as well as treating the people that were ill. 17th century cutting edge medical care. Oh, this was this was good. You had cupping, which was getting a heated cup and placing it over the skin to draw out the blood or the pus that was there. Uh, sort of, that's where the infection is, we're going to pull it out, which was fine as long as the infection didn't get into the whole body. Uh, this was connected with leaching, oh, the delightful practice of attaching live leeches, again, to draw off the toxins and the poisons that were in the blood. Um, actually, leeches have sort of come back in more recent years. Um, some people um, promote or at least advise using a leech when there's an infection in a specific area. Uh, I have to admit, none of my doctors have, have uh, suggested that as yet. Uh, leeching evolved into blood lancing or lancing the vein to let the blood flow. Uh, you could use... Um, uh, a scalpel to do that and just slice the vein, or you could use a machine like the one you see in the picture. This is called a scarificator, and it had from four to 20 blades that were very sharp, and you would place it on the skin, and then you would press a button, and it would slice the skin, and the blood would begin to flow, and they would gather a certain amount of blood that they wanted to draw out. Uh, that sounds absolutely wonderful, doesn't it? Uh, in the 18th and 19th century, uh, the number of hospitals increased. Some of these were funded by the government. Uh, most of them were privately supported. You had a, a group of people who wanted to have a hospital in a specific area. Either someone supported it 
or a group of people who had money supported it. These were run by boards um, that would decide how the, the care was going to be given, who was going to be accepted into the hospital, et cetera. Um, the, meta, the elite, the rich people, they were cared for by medical professionals, usually at home. Uh, they didn't go into the hospital. The hospitals, even though they tried, they were still kind of <clears throat> uh, holes for um, infection, et cetera. Um, so the rich people still got cared for at home by medical professionals. Working class still relied heavily on the folk remedies that their grandmothers and great grandmothers had promoted. Um, and some of those drugs that they used then actually came into use by the medical profession, such as foxglove, which was used to treat heart ailments on a folk remedy type of thing. But eventually, the doctors began using it, and and uh, it's used today. Um, they they give it to um, to heart patients, to sort of get your heart going. Uh, early American hospitals resembled the European almshouses, so um, the poor, the old, the the very ill went into these almshouses and were looked after. Um, the the sick people were looked after by the people who were in there. Um, for 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 the sick people were looked after by people who were there that were poor. Um, they didn't have a place to go. They didn't have a home. They were homeless. So they stayed in the almshouse, almshouse and these were the people who looked after the, the ill people. Um, in, the, in the 19th century, we still had the traditional, uh, the emetics, the purgatives that made you go and made you puke. Uh, you had ointments and poultices and bleeding poultices were um, various and sundry uh, herbs and roots that were sewn into uh, cloth bags and then put on something that was infected, put on a, a limb that was infected. They used opium to suppress coughs, to calm the diarrhea, and to soothe the patient. Basically, it, you know, if you're in a lot of pain, you can't get a lot of rest. There was medical progress in the 19th century. They started using anesthetics um, so that they could put you to sleep when they had to actually do um, a bit of surgery. They also discovered that germs were bad and they started using antiseptics. Um, they, they discovered alcohol was good. You know, sometimes you watch an old Western and someone is, is pouring whiskey or something over a wound. Well, you know, that was really smart because that was full of alcohol. Uh, there were nursing care advances in the 19th century, uh, promoted a lot of, in a lot of cases by Florence Nightingale in the Crimean War and through nursing during the Civil War. Nurses went from being someone that was just sort of a camp follower to someone that was well-respected and, and this was a profession. Um, also, the 19th century improved standards of cleanliness and sanitation. We discovered that doctors shouldn't go from one patient to another without washing his or her hands. Mental health, um, it's a little better today, but I think it's still, uh, well, it's a lot better today. Patients that were mentally ill would be treated as outcasts. They may be burned as witches or locked away in some terrible places. The treatment could actually worsen the symptoms, and physical illness is often followed. Um, the, in the 19th century, they began to recognize that mental health patients had a disease. It wasn't just something that they were, uh, it wasn't something that just came to them or that they brought on themselves or they were making up. There were some mental health hospitals. A lot of them were um, not places you would want to go. They didn't always treat the patients very well. They discovered that medicines couldn't control some of the symptoms. And there were very slow improvements when it came to mental health in the hospitals. There was a breakthrough in 1928 in, in medicine in general. Alexander Fleming accidentally discovered an isolated penicillin. And after that, more antibiotics followed. Uh, and this was a big jump. In uh, World War I, you see a lot of people still dying of infections. By World War II, you had antibiotics and you had ways to treat these things so that fewer men died of infections following a wound.
um, there were lots of causes of death. And as we've seen, uh, an epidemic can cause the number of deaths from one disease to skyrocket for a brief period of time. Usually after that, it sort of settles down at least for a while. When you're studying cause of death at, during an epidemic, the cause of death may not specifically state all the contributing causes. Uh, medical breakthroughs did cut the numbers of deaths from some diseases. Uh, pneumonia and tuberculosis or consumption were number one and number two for many, many years. Uh, tuberculosis for the 1950s, influenza and pneumonia were four and seven for a lot of time also. Um, if you, if you look at this, um, this chart, you can see the number of deaths per 1,000 in 1900, excuse me, per 100,000 in 1900 and 1910. And you can see in 1900, pneumonia and influenza and tuberculosis were the two top ones. Uh, nowadays, it's cancer and heart disease. So you can see that uh, pneumonia and influenza now is only 16.2 down from 200 and 202.2. So you see things have changed a lot. The causes of death have changed significantly. Uh, this is Boston causes of death in 1811. And you can look at these, but such so just some highlights. Number one was consumption with 221 deaths in Boston. Uh, childbed or child or stillbirths were 63. Old age or decay, which would probably include Alzheimer's, senility, and just your body breaking down, that was 46. Whooping cough or lockjaw, 16. We now have uh, a, a, um, a vaccination for that. That's almost disappeared. Sudden death, which they didn't know what it was. That was 25. Diarrhea or dysentery, 19. 19 people died of that. Ugh. Uh, infantile flux 57, those were for babies. So babies didn't have a, a really good um, chance at life in those days. 12 people died of syphilis, two of intemperance. That was drinking. Uh, that was a, a big deal. Um, diseases, as we know, have often have occupational or environmental causes. You have lung diseases, cancers, and other diseases. Um, people that would get lung diseases were chimney sweeps, miners, asbestos workers, textile workers, farmers, concrete workers, smokers, and people who were in a smoking environment. Bossy jaw was particular to people who worked with matches, who made matches. Um, this was a chronic exposure to the white phosphorus that was then deposited in the bones of people who made matches and that would lead to brain tumors. So that was an, an, in, um, an occupational disease. And then we have, oh, just pronouncing this, pneumoconiosis or minor's disease. I, I would prefer minor's disease because it's easier to say. This was from breathing coal dust and it resulted in either fibrosis of the lungs or in um, cancers. Uh, fibrosis of the lungs is also known as black consumption, black lung disease, uh, black phthisis, coal lung, and Collier's asthma. It also increased the risk of tuberculosis and chronic bronchitis. Uh, people who developed this, and you can see a healthy set of lungs versus on the right, a not so healthy set of lungs. This would lead to coughing, shortness of breath, injury to the respiratory tissues, and this could lead to death within two years. So black lung, I still heard about this when I was a child. Uh, minors would get black lung disease and it was a terrible thing that they'd had to deal with. Uh, the most interesting I have to admit was um, chimney sweeps cancer, also called a soot wart. This was carcinoma of the skin as a scrotum. The warts were caused by soot irritation. Uh, the the uh, chimney sweeps would get dirty, they would get soot all over them, and then they would sweat, and the sweat would go down under their clothes and settle in certain areas of their body, and then that would develop into cancer. Now, this was more in England than in Germany, because in Germany, the, the fashion was for tighter clothing, and the tighter clothing actually prevented 
the, the deposits. This was the first occupational cancer with, that was identified in 1775 in England. There was a uh, treatment, you could have surgery, no anesthetics, or you could use a, oh, how delightful, an arsenic paste. Imagine how much good that would do. Boys as young as eight years old were identified, were diagnosed as having this soot wart or the uh, chimney sweeps cancer. So imagine being eight years old, uh, having been climbing up and down the, the chimney for years, and now you have cancer of the scrotum. You've heard of Matt as a hatter, I'm sure. We had hatter's disease, 17th to the 20th centuries. This was caused by chronic mercury poisoning, exposure to the vapors of mercury. Mercury was used to treat the fur of small animals, which was used to make felt for the hat. Um, this would cause mental confusion, which is why they'd say Matt as a hatter, emotional disturbances, muscular weakness, and eventually loss of hearing teeth, hair, and nails. It also caused poor memory, shyness, oddly enough, and severe neurological and kidney damage. They also called it the Danbury Shakes, Danbury, Connecticut being a big place where they would make hats and people would develop it there. Um, one of them in the 20th century was radiation sickness, uh, exposure to radioactive materials, either accidental or medical. And we typically think of this as being something that um, uh, people who worked with the atomic bomb or something might, or people who were exposed to an atomic uh, blast might have. This would cause vomiting, diarrhea, headache, hemorrhage, infections, and cancer. But there were some girls who developed radiation sickness in the uh, early 1900s. These were called the radium girls. And they used a nice little tiny paintbrush to paint watch dials with a luminous paint so that people could see their, could read their watches or clocks in the night. They would, they would need a fine point on their, their paintbrushes. So they would lick the paintbrush to get a nice point, dip, and then paint. And of course, they were getting this stuff on their, their lips and tongue. They discovered what fun it was to actually have glowing lips. And they started using the radium um, to, to paint their faces, you know, sort of an interesting, oh, I'm going to do this, and, and it'll look interesting when I'm out with my boyfriend. And eventually, they develop uh, vomiting, diarrhea, et cetera, and died. And um, if, you, if you Google radium girls, you'll see uh, more information about that. And you see the picture down in the lower right. Here's, the, here's death going around to these girls that are licking their paintbrushes. Um, and then with diseases, we've talked about the occupational or environmental. We also get genetic uh, age-related and life choices. The genetic ones are ones that are inherited. It's a mutation of a gene that's already in your system. And some of these are Tay-Sachs disease, sickle cell, cystic fibrosis, some cancers, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and hypertension. We all know that some of us have a genetic propensity for some of these diseases. Then we have age-related or natural decay. Again, cardiovascular diseases in there, cancer, arthritis, dementia, osteoporosis, diabetes, hypertension, and Alzheimer's. These are all age-related uh, natural um, dis disintegration. And then we have the oops choices. Again, uh, cardiovascular disease, cancer, diabetes, and hypertension. You could say people who um, like a lot of red meat, like I do, uh, you kind of might end up with some cardiovascular disease. People who smoke, like my father-in-law, might get cancer, et cetera, et cetera. So these are all genetic, age-related, and life choice diseases. And probably one of the biggest life choice disease um, of the past was syphilis also known by a lot of different names. The English called it the French pox or distemper. The French called it the Italian disease. Other people called it the Polish sickness, the Portuguese sickness, the German sickness, Neapolitan sickness, bad blood, uh, the pox. You also, it's also called the evil of Bay St. Paul. Again, we're always blaming it on someone else some other country, some other city, they're the ones who had syphilis and gave it to us. Um, this is a World War II poster 
um, you see syphilis, all of these men have it. Women, stay away from the dance halls. Uh, you didn't get it by dancing with the men, but you got it by maybe what came later from the dancing. You have uh, infectious and contagious diseases. These were transmitted by contact between hosts. Now the host could be human, animal, or insect. Um, you had diseases that were uh, spread by air, touch, blood, or other bodily secretions. Uh, in air, you have the chickenpox, influenza, and measles. Uh, touch conjunctivitis, that's uh, an eye infection or cold sores. Uh, sneezing, you can share mumps, colds, and tuberculosis. And blood, of course, black plague, malaria, and HIV. And remember that uh, the ones that bl with blood, uh, malaria especially, we, we know about this. The, the mosquitoes would bite one person, then carry it to someone else and bite them and share the blood. And of course, we all know about HIV um, from, the, from more recent years. So you see all of these things, this is how um, diseases are spread. And of course, we're still trying to figure out exactly how COVID is spread. Is it, is it the air, the, the touch, the blood, et cetera? So we're still working on that. Um, we have leprosy. That was a big disease in the past. It was caused by a bacterial infection. It was highly contagious. It spread through drop, droplet infection and it could incubate in your system for from two to seven years. So you may be exposed and it would be years before you knew you had it. In the past, lepers were feared. They were forced to live separately. They had to wear distinctive clothing, ring bells when they were coming around. Um, they would even send them off to live in colonies so they weren't around any other people. It's curable now and there are very, very few new cases for um, uh, leprosy. Typhus and typhoid, these are two things that are actually totally different diseases, but a lot of people use them interchangeably. Um, and I tell you, if you ask me in five minutes, I won't remember which one is which without looking at the screens. Um, typhus is not a virus, but it's not quite a bacteria. It's transmitted to humans via external parasites. Fleas, lice, ticks, all the, the little bugs that are running around that are on rats and other humans. So this is the way it spread, <coughs> excuse me. It would cause headache, fever, chills, rash. You would get deranged by your fever and eventually if it went far enough, you'd die. It was also known as jail or jail fever. G-A-O-L is pronounced jail. Uh, prison fever, factory fever, ship fever, and camp fever. So anywhere you have a lot of people gathering that you might get typhus. It wasn't until the end of the 19th century that they figured out that it was different from typhoid fever. Now, typhoid fever means typhus-like, okay? And you got this, it was a bacterial infection, and it was transmitted by eating or drinking what has been contaminated by a carrier's feces. This was caused by poor sanitation, overcrowding, and war, because war promotes poor sanitation and overcrowding. Uh, you developed a fever, weakness, abdominal pain. Death was usually due to dehydration and cardiac arrest. It was also known as French typhus and again, jail, prison, factory, ship, or camp fever. Uh, this is the sort of thing that um, happened in cities and in smaller areas where people would dump their chamber pots out of the, the window in the morning and it would land in the street that was not concrete. It was usually either stone with dirt in between or just dirt. And then the, the bacteria would go down through the, the ground and into the water supply that supplied the, the well at the end of the street. You drink out of the well and then you would end up getting typhus so, uh, or typhoid fever. So you see, this is definitely crowded, uh, caused by poor sanitation. Cholera was also a bacterial disease. It was of the small intestine. The incubation period was very short, two hours to five days. It was spread by food or drink contaminated by human feces. Again, poor sanitation. Uh, people didn't wash their hands after doing certain things. 
it was marked by vomiting, diarrhea, and a blue skin. It was treated by bleeding, by mercury, and by opium. There were regular epidemics and pandemics in the 1800s. This is not cholera in phantom. That's something that was mainly just in children. But as you can see in the picture, you have death um, pumping the water for all the children. And this is how uh, these people got cholera. Smallpox or variola or blackpox. This was a virus that was inhaled. It had a 12 day incubation period. So you could get it and it would be almost two weeks before you would develop the symptoms. Fever, muscle pain, respiratory problems. Smallpox was the major disease. It had a mortality rate of 30 to 35%. 80% of infected children died. That is a high mortality rate for children. Uh, Long-term effects for those that survived, scars, blindness, arthritis. Um, they also had a, a smaller uh, smallpox that was called minor. Its mortality rate was only 1%, which sounds horrible to us, but uh, compared to the uh, 30 to 35 percent, it wasn't as bad. There were many epidemics of uh, smallpox, and that has been eradicated, thank goodness. Diphtheria. Um, diphtheria is deadly. Immunization is the safeguard, and you see that everybody wanted to get their children vaccinated. It was also known as malignant sore throat. It was a bacterial disease of the throat passed by coughing and sneezing. Um, fever, chilled, cyanosis, that's when your skin turns blue, sore throat, cough. You had white patches on the throat. Now, it may be a mild case, but severe cases would swell the throat up. People couldn't breathe, and then they would die. So this was something that you wanted to protect your children from. Uh, and then, of course, we have bubonic or black plague. Um, there were actually three types of bacteria for this. There were a number of epidemics, uh, but probably the biggest one was 14th century, the Black Death. A lot of people died. It was transmitted by the bite of a flea, the fleas that were on the rats and on other people. It would inflame the lymph nodes, cause chills and fever. The skin would de decay while the patient was still alive. And one would develop gangrene in the extremities so that your fingers and toes and feet would start to have problems. And you can see in this picture here, in this map, um, 1347, it's still over in Asia Minor. 1348, it's in uh, Southern Europe. 1349, Northern Europe. And by 1350, it's up in the Scandinavian countries and in England. So you see it moves, it progresses along. These were the way people moved around. These days, that could spread a lot faster because of uh, the how much faster we move. Uh, tuberculosis was one of the big diseases of the 19th century, uh, also called consumption or wasting disease, the white plague, and the long sickness, long because it took a long time to die. It usually affected the lungs, but it could affect other parts of the body. It was spread through the air um, into bacteria, by bacteria, through a cough, a sneeze, speaking, or spitting. Uh, spitting was a big deal. People would chew their tobacco and then they would spit in the cuspidors. And um, that's one reason why people, fewer and fewer people chew tobacco these days. And when they don't, they don't spit into public spittoons because they finally learned that this was a source of consumption and other diseases. Uh, it would lead to fever, chills, loss of appetite, weight loss, and fatigue. Your lungs would basically die, they would go necrotic, and that was what would lead to death. Uh, it can eventually lead to other diseases. Probably the most famous person who had um, consumption or tuberculosis uh, was John Henry Doc Holliday of Tombstone fame. Uh, and you see him, he, how thin he is, he, he looks thin here, he was never very robust because he had tuberculosis. That's one reason he traveled the West was to look for better air. And you can see a picture of him shortly before he died in Colorado. He's in bed there. Um, consumption carriers, people who had consumption, they looked for relief. And the late 19th century was a good time to travel for this. The Industrial Revolution brought the epidemic, uh, 
but and it was worse than cities because of pollution and crowding but people would travel both in europe and in the u.s seeking relief or cures the mountains and the southwest that had fresh dry or cool air was the place that many people went and you see this is a, a tuberculosis clinic um, these are people all in bed and they're facing the windows with the sun in all likelihood, the windows were open because it was thought that the cool air, even if they were cold, they were bundled up in their beds, that this was better for their lungs. Um, consumption in El Paso is sort of a uh, cautionary tale. Uh, down in the picture, you see the Hendricks Law Sanatorium. Um, there were a number of um, hotels, boarding houses, private homes, and there were nine sanitaria for people in El Paso. Before 1880, tuberculosis was very rare among the Hispanic population in El Paso. But after 1880, railroads brought about 25,000 patients to the area seeking relief for their consumption. Most of these are male, and they lived in these places. The Hispanic women of the area ended up being the domestics, the people who would clean areas, the caregivers, the people who would uh, take care of them, clean the bedding, uh, feed them, et cetera, and also intimate partners. And so there was a 50% higher rate for Hispanic women than for Hispanic males. But by 1915, the death rate for Hispanics was four times higher than the average. This is the death rate. So uh, all these Hispanics, they hadn't been exposed to much tuberculosis. They had no uh, herd, or excuse me, herd immunity. And so they were exposed to this and a lot of them got, got sick and died. They took it home to their own families who got sick and died. Now we're gonna discuss some of the diseases you should know. This is gonna be very quick. These are things maybe you've run across or read about. Um, an abscess is the formation of pus anywhere in the body and it's caused by infection. Um, that's just an abscess. The bilious fever is a fever with nausea or vomiting. That's what bilious means, is nausea. Bilious attack is a gallbladder attack. When you see biliousness, this is jaundice associated with liver disease. So all of these things, they sound the same, but they're actually all a little bit different. Brain fever or spinal fever was meningitis. Bronze John or yellow jack was yellow fever. Uh, Catterall was nose and throat discharge like from a cold. Colic was uh, an abdominal pain causing cramping. Commotion, commotion was a concussion. So if you fell down, hit your head hard enough, you had a commotion in your brain. Congestive chills or congestive fever, um, Intermittent fever, jungle fever, marsh fever, all of these were malaria, swamp fever, ague. So you see malaria had a lot of different names. A corruption was any type of infection. A cramp colic was appendicitis. Uh, death struck or softening, softening of the brain was stroke, which was also known as apoplexy. Dropsy was acute swelling or edema. Dropsy of the brain was encephalitis. Um, confinement was childbirth. Falling sickness was epilepsy. Green sickness, anemia. Uh, gripes were colic, usually in children. The grip was an influenza-like symptom. So grip and gripes were two so totally different things. Insulation was sunstrokes. The uh, king's evil was tuberculosis of the neck or lymph glands, lockjaw, uh, which was tetanus. Lung fever was pneumonia. Mania was insanity. Uh, marasmus was severe malnutrition. You'll sometimes see that for children that didn't thrive. You'll see that they, they had marasmus. They just couldn't get enough uh, nutrition in them. The mariner's disease was scurvy. We know all about that. You're going to eat your oranges and your lemons. Pressure gangrene was a bed sore. Putrid sore throat, rash fever, rosalia, scarlatina, scarlet rash, throat fever. This was all scarlet fever. Quincy was tonsillitis. I had that a lot as a child. Rickets was caused by a lack of calcium and it caused weakening of the bones. 
an act of God was an unexplained death and a visitation of God was unknown causes. Now, how are you going to, to treat these diseases? Well, um, acetate of lead was one of them. Uh, this was used to treat diarrhea, cholera, and intestinal ulcers. This was also known as lead acetate, sugar of lead, lead sugar, salt of Saturn, and Goulard's powder. Uh, this was highly toxic. And it even says poison right on that, that um, jar. Um, it says poison. And it really didn't help that much. It didn't help at all. You have antimony. This is coal. And it was used for anemic. That would make you go a lot. It was to treat pneumonia and alcohol abuse. Well, that'll certainly teach you. Uh, you would take one of these pills and it would irritate your bowels by releasing respiratory mucus. So basically, your respiratory system would create all this mucus that would go into your digestive system, and then that would cause everything to come out the other end. The thing about these pills is that they didn't digest. One was supposed to search for the, the used pills and reuse them. Yum! Uh, this was very toxic, and this may have been what killed Mozart. Um, these are blue pills. This is not the little blue pills we know of today. This was a purgative made of mercury. Oh, that's healthy. Licorice, rose water, powdered rose, honey, sugar, water, or any mixture. Now, licorice, rose water, powdered rose, honey, and sugar, water. This isn't going to do anything. Mercury was highly toxic. It was poison. So I don't think it's going to help you that much. It's probably going to end up killing you. This is called blue mass, and it was used to treat diarrhea, dysentery, and typhoid fever. It contains chamomile, uh, mercurous oxide, mercurous chloride, excuse me, mer mercury and chalk, basically. This was extremely toxic, and Abraham Lincoln used this stuff. Um, this isn't what killed him, obviously, but he used it. Ooh. Um, Godfrey's cordial. Oh, doesn't that sound nice? It was used to treat fretfulness and colic uh, and dehydration. It was regularly given to infants and children. It contained sugar, water, flavoring, and opium. It led to opium overdoses in children. If you had a baby that was fretful or colicky, yeah, let's give them a little opium to calm them down. Um, this is Dr. Williams' pink pills for pale people. Uh, it was used to treat chronic headaches, weakness, palpitations of the heart, cholera, paralysis. It provided energy. Um, it contained Epsom salts and iron. It wasn't toxic, but it certainly wasn't a cure for anything. Um, this is a bottle of Dr. Guterin's nerve syrup. It was used to treat epilepsy, uh, St. Vitus dance, which is now Sydenham's uh, Korea, convulsions, hysteria, nervous prostration, insomnia, neurasthenia, and disorders of the nervous system. People would take these when they, had, when they were nervous. It contained potassium, sodium, ammonium, mixed with sugar, glycerin, and, and uh, colored water. The ammonium, of course, was toxic. Oh, there's so many wonderful toxic things. Dr. Hutchinson's pills. Now, these were used to treat syphilis. Aren't those bottles pretty? Contained chalk, opium, and mercury. They were toxic and useless. Uh, paragoric. Now, we had paragoric in my medicine cabinet when I was a child. It contained honey, licorice, flavors, spirit of wine, and opium. It was a household remedy in the 19th and 20th centuries. It was for toothache, diarrhea, teething, and coughs. And let me tell you, and it's got, it's a narcotic exempt. It's got this big red X on it. Um, when I was a child, I never, ever, ever wanted to have diarrhea because I knew I, my parents would give me some of that. And that stuff tasted terrible. It was sold over the counter. Anybody could buy it until 1970. It's still available by prescription. But why on earth anyone would take it is beyond me. Blech. Um, so you have all these diseases and all these cures. So how are you going to discover a specific cause of death for someone that died? Well, if you're lucky, the first thing you'll be able to check out would be death records. This would be the county or the city, and these are mainly, mainly post-1900. 
they didn't really have too much of death records with that type of information before. There were also coroner's records, either for the city or the county. And a lot of these may not exist. They weren't always thought to be very important. And so they were not always preserved well, and they may have been destroyed or may have just fallen apart. Uh, you could also check your local mortuary to see if a mortuary record exists. Now, a mortuary record is a business record, and they're usually a little bit better taken care of than just government records. Um, they may have been preserved by the business if it's still in existence. You have a mortuary that gets sold and sold and sold. They may still have those old records. If we're lucky, they may have given the old records to a, a historical society or a library that have been published. That's if we're really lucky. Um, you can also use obituaries, local or regional newspapers. Remember that um, if someone died in one county, they may have had contacts in another county or they may have had relatives. So an obituary may mention their death. Uh, there are other news items as well. Sometimes you have uh, a news item before someone dies that indicates someone is down with uh, influenza or with a stomach fever or something like that. So you want to check the newspapers around the time the person died, maybe several weeks before and after the death. You can look for mortality schedules for the census, 1850 to 1880. The problem is these are not complete. Um, if a family moved um, or everyone in the family died, the family's deaths didn't always get recorded. Um, and even then people would forget, and it's only the one year just prior to the census, so you can miss a lot there. Um, cemetery records, sometimes they will have a cause of death, and sometimes you will have a city or county mortuary list in the newspapers. Um, you have one here, this is uh, an example. Um, the following is the mortuary list for the month of May, and it lists all these people their name, their age, and what they died of, death caused by accident, stillborn, confinement, old age, consumption, typhoid fever, et cetera. So you can get some information about a cause of death out of a newspaper, even if you don't get parents' names or anything like that. We're going to mention briefly the causes of death and contributing causes. Causes of death in 1900, pneumonia and influenza were number one. Uh, pneumonia was called the old person's friend. Uh, it was said, left untreated, the sufferer often lapses into a state of reduced consciousness, slipping peacefully away in their sleep, giving a dignified end to a period of often considerable suffering. So if you had someone that was in bad shape physically, they didn't get up and move around much, um, they, they might develop pneumonia because they're not moving, they're not breathing heavily to get all the mucus out. That turns into uh, something that that will kill them, it kills them, and they, they've they had sort of a, a low um, quality of death beforehand, so they would call that the old person's friend, uh, either that or the heir's friend, I'm not sure. Uh, contributing causes are very important when you're looking at pneumonia uh, and influenza as well, because as we're seeing with the COVID, uh, a lot of people who uh, get very sick with COVID, that die with COVID, they have underlying medical issues. They're either of a certain age, of which I fall into, uh, they have diabetes or some other illness, uh, cancer, uh, something that makes them a little more susceptible to diseases. So when you're looking at the cause of death, like right now, it might they might say that COVID is what killed them but you have to look and see what other contributing causes of death. And it's true in the past, someone may have died of pneumonia, but you look at what else was wrong with them. Did they have a liver complaint? Did they have kidney problems or cardiovascular disease? These are all things that um, caused the, helped cause the death, brought on the pneumonia. So you need to pay attention to contributing causes when they're listing, listed. Uh, beware of lies. Uh, there are lies out there when it comes to causes of death. Lies to benefit someone else, some of the community, if we want to whitewash the history. Uh, uh, lie to benefit a business, to eliminate liability or blame. Lies to benefit a family, they want to hide a scandal or a suicide because 
maybe insurance won't pay out for a suicide, or lies to cover a crime with a large or small conspiracy. Now, this is Tram, James Tram Khan. This is one of my husband's relatives. Um, he was born in 1882 in Kentucky. He married Julia Brewer and moved to Douglas County, Illinois. He farmed and he also worked for the railroad. By 1930, he had three daughters and a son, Roy, who was born in 1918. The railroads were being unionized and he crossed the lines. So he wasn't really popular in his area. He had a neighbor who was uh, a union man who was suspected of stealing uh, eggs and milking cows some chickens and that sort of thing. And the two of them had problems. That's just the background. Tuesday, September 5th, 1933, Tram went out early to milk the cow. He didn't return. So Julia sent 15-year-old Roy to look for him. Roy returned and said that Tram was dead. Now, Roy was very shaken and he needed his mother. So she called for help, but she didn't go out to look. The body was removed for inquest and they ruled suicide. The body went to her funeral home, then it was buried and Julia never really examined Tram's body. A few months later, some Kentucky relatives of Tram's contacted her about some gossip they had heard. They had heard that the coroner's jury contained the suspect neighbor who'd been stealing from Tram, supposedly, that man's friends, and there was one other very frightened neighbor who was the source of this information. The death record said that Tram had been almost decapitated with a corn knife. Now that's a corn knife, that's not the corn knife, but it's a corn knife. It was ruled a suicide, but the family believes that it was probably murder. There's no proof, but they believe the jury was suborned, um, and that was that. So nothing was ever changed, but this was something you have to be aware of and be careful of, that what you read may not always be accurate. If you're looking for a cause of death, uh, death records, coroner's records, obituaries, newspapers, you can see an example right here. That's what you want to look for. Also look for letters and diaries of, of people within the area uh, or relatives that may talk about what caused a specific person's death. If you're investigating a cause of death, refer to a volume from the bibliography in the handout that you have, or use an unabridged dictionary. Your local library has a great big giant dictionary, I'm sure, sitting somewhere in the reference area. You can also search Google or some other search engine, just put in the, the, the word. Um, the problem is sometimes when you're reading the cause of death, you can't quite read it. So you may have to get creative, and it wasn't always spelled right anyway. Read the history of an area or the newspapers for information about epidemics. Note the contributing causes and investigate what those were. If you see a weird word, look it up and figure it out. Research contemporary treatment of that specific diseases and the contributing causes to that disease because everything is all tied in together and will help inform you about your own health as you're doing this research. And I would like to thank you for checking in with us today. And I will leave you with a little, little cartoon here. Here is death coming around at Halloween. I've come for your soul. Ooh, is that chocolate? So uh, let's all hope for chocolate and that death will stay outside eating that. Do you all have any questions? 